Good evening. I'm a graduate of New Haven Public School. I'm a recovering public school teacher. And as such, I've been subject to mandates on both the federal and state levels of government. In spite of public school curricula, including as a standard, that students in social studies learn about the city or state, the city or town and state in which they live, and about civics, Previous federal policy has emphasized reading and math over civics, no child left behind, and current policy, every student succeeds, favors STEM over civics. Yet mission statements across the country, public school mission statements, promise to produce students who are prepared to go out into the world and be empowered, responsible citizens. So how is it that 22% of our nation's eighth graders are proficient in civic literacy? Only 22%. There's two startling facts that are noteworthy. This number is down 2% from 2018 when the test was last administered and where progress hovered since 1998 when the National Assessment of Educational Progress produced this uh, assessment for the first time. Secondly, the civics assessment is not given in 12th grade, the time when civic knowledge matters most because young people are being graduated into the world having been promised the education that will prepare them to be empowered, responsible contributors to society. So how is it that literate, empowered, productive, liberated citizens exist in a society that's not teaching its people about citizenship? How do we stop believing that government officials are the supreme authority, when in fact, they're public servants and not above the law. Eric Liu, author and founder of Civic University and his own TED Talks, simply defines power in the context of civic engagement. Liu explains that power derives from various sources. Physical force, such as police or military power. Money buys desired outcomes. Local, state, and federal governments can compel people to act or not act according to policy and law. A fourth source of power are the actions and behaviors that a society believes are acceptable or normal. Ideas motivate and influence. And finally, the more people acting in a unified, legitimate manner, the more favorable their outcomes. So as an educator and one deeply concerned about the well-being of my community, I am impelled to teach you why you must pursue civic education. Literacy, not just reading, writing, and math, but civic literacy is the most important measure of success and liberty. My father was a behavioral counselor who loved politics. As I grow to appreciate it, <laughs> I'm reminded of a story that he would tell about the stark contrast between the youth at the private school my brother attended and the youth at a juvenile detention center in Boston. His story ends with telling the youth in the juvenile detention center that the youth in the private school are being prepared to lead and control them. The stats are indicative. The majority of the people are performing at or below a basic level of knowledge and mastery and proficiency in areas that shape worldview, while a small minority maintain governance, control, and power. So whether you live in Seattle, Washington, Chicago, Illinois, Houston, Texas, or right here around Dixwell Avenue in New Haven, Connecticut, the Constitution is the supreme law. 
The Constitution is the basis of law upon which all within a jurisdiction must adhere, even the, those in the government. In fact, the majority of articles in the Constitution explicitly list the power and authority that government branches and government officials have. One article, a declaration or bill of rights, lists the private rights of the people. So again, how do we stop believing that government and government officials are the supreme authority when in fact they are not under the law and public servants? We have to know we have to know, we have to, we have to know, we have to read, we have to study. We have to look up words that you don't think you know. So that the great and essential principles of liberty and free governments may be recognized and established. Article one, section two of this constitution of the state of Connecticut declares that all political power is inherent in the people. What is power? Lou defines power as the capacity to make people do what you would have them to do. Inherent in the people belonging to, who are the people? You, me, us, collectively. That all free governments, free in this context means that it's not tyrannical or oppressive. It protects the private rights and privileges of the people. They're founded on their authority and instituted for their benefit, and they have at all times a right that cannot be taken away to alter their form of government in the manner that they think expedient. So I leave you with the memory of William Lanson. William Lanson is a man who, in 1835, had wealth. He had ideas. He had numbers. So many behind him that he was elected black governor or the king of New Haven. He was an entrepreneur who provided jobs. He must be memorialized because it was his work on building the Farmington Canal and Long Wharf that provided for New Haven's economic success. He is the founder of the Dixwell Congregational Church, one of the first churches in our nation. He provided housing for enslaved beings. Housing and, 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 and religious gatherings. And when the government wanted to deny blacks right to vote, he petitioned the government to allow us to vote or to exempt us from taxes. All these are forms of civic engagement. So there's a principle of law that says, ignorance of the law excuses not. I add to that, that knowledge of the law empowers a lot. Thank you.